Hello, this is Anne de Gist, and uh, we're going to be doing a deep dive on why you should take the bivalent vaccine and why it's protective against the new variants. There's been a lot of misinformation out there, and I'm getting a lot of requests for information. So we're going to do a quick deep dive on this. So let's first do the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good news is the bivalent vaccine is protective against BA5 and BQ1. We'll talk about this. Right now, it's all quiet on the COVID front, i.e. Uh, there's not a huge amount of hospitalization mortality, but we expect an upcoming winter wave in December. Paxlovid uh, does really help if you take it during an acute infection to decrease the long COVID risk, and that's the ultimate problem with COVID. It's no longer mortality. It's the, the bad news if you have that 5 to 30% chance of getting long COVID. The bad is that BA5 is being replaced quickly by this family of BQ1. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, some of the Omicron uh, infection can last up to 14 days, so you really need to, to test yourself more than five days. Only 10% of Americans got a bivalent vaccine, so we're going to be exposed in the winter wave that's coming. Uh, you really need to wait 60 days after an infection. A lot of people have been infected by COVID by now. And the long COVID risk is real for kids, so you cannot just assume it's for the adult. The ugly is that this COVID multiple reinfection are now tied to an overall decrease in overall health. And we'll talk a, a, a bit of a, a deep dive on what type of complication have arisen after people got COVID. China is getting ready with building 691,000 hospital beds in anticipation of the upcoming surge. And we do a, a little bit of update on the RSV that's surging and filling up all the pediatric hospitals. Just a quick reminder, I'm not a doctor. I'm just taking published information from reliable source like the CDC, JAMA, and Nature, and I'm helping translate this in English to help you make an informed decision. So all quiet on the COVID front, but if you look historically in 2021, you can see that we had that rise pretty much tied with the holidays in Europe uh, as well as in the U.S., so the fact that we are lower right now is consistent to what we saw last year. So don't assume that we don't have some issues coming up in four to six weeks. This is the alphabet soup of Omicron. Uh, you can see it's getting complicated. Uh, the one we're really tracking now is this BQ1 and BQ11, which is an evolution of the BA5. So let's kind of do a bit of a deeper dive. Uh, you can see BA5 now is going downwards. It's not getting to be the minority in the U.S. And BQ1 and BQ11, which is the next variant, are over 50% of the case in the U.S. So if you do get infected in the coming weeks, you shouldn't assume it's BQ1. And that has some implication in the type of treatment that works. Uh, interesting data on 63,000 participants showing that after five days, 80% of people are still positive and infectious. So you really want uh, to, to, to use the antigen. And one of the things we know with the antigen testing is that they are not as accurate as when we had the Wuhan curve. And so uh, it's been reported that some of the, this antigen testing are only 70% accurate. So you need to do multiple testing. Uh, I think just to remind you that protection is a combination of inoculation of the vaccine and infection. And in China, only 17% of the population has some type of immunity, and that's because their vaccines are really not very effective. Sinovac and Sinopharm have only between 24 to 35% efficacy. In Russia, for example, they decided to do the opposite of China. They, I call it let it rip, which means pretty much close to the majority of, of Russians have got COVID. And one of the problems is Sputnik V, which is their vaccine, is only 44% effective against infection there. So if you look at the U.S., we estimate that around 60% of Americans have been infected at least once. Um, and of course, uh, uh, Japan is on the lower side at 39%. China is therefore anticipating some wave to come. And you can see they've been building these hospital pods, as I call it, 691,000 spreading over some of the biggest cities um, uh, in China, but really focusing on Shanghai, which is kind of interesting there. So they do expect some complications there. Uh, this is a very interesting study that just came out. Uh, it was done from the Veteran Administration, and they look at people who had no infection. That's around 5 million people as a control group. People had one COVID infection, which is around 443,000, and over two infections, which is roughly 10% of that. And, and, and so it's a very, very good data set, very reliable. 
And what it shows is that it's not related to long COVID. It's just that COVID is such a wreck on your immune system in your body that it increases other type of risk. And the mortality risk go up by 2%, by 2x. And the hospitalization go up by 3x. And you can see that there's clearly a correlation if you get one infection, which is green, two infection in red, and three infection in that purple color. So when people say, oh, you know, I already got COVID, who cares, I'll get another one. Really don't do that. You know, don't uh, really, you know, it is not good for your health. Would it be for the kidney, the musculoskeleton, the, the pulmonology, the cardiovascular? You can see there's an increase that's quite significant. Uh, we, we have what's called the hazard ratio, which is the multiples versus normal, one being normal there for the rest of the population. And you see this huge increase in hazard ratio, which is really worrisome if you get a second or third infection there. So if you have been infected once, please get your vaccine to avoid you know, getting reinfected a second time because it's an overall uh, increase in your risk for your health overall. All cause mortality are going up and, and it's basically measured post-acute and at six months. Is that you would expect people were uh, hospitalized, you know, had a higher, higher complication rate. This is a very good article in Nature. Uh, unfortunately, only 10% of Americans got the bivalent vaccine. I think a lot of people may have a full sense of protection from having been infected or having had mild symptoms in that first infection. And you can see that the people over the age of 65, it's 27%, and that's good news because they're at higher risk. But the rest of the population is still at risk. And, and so I would highly recommend as we're getting towards Thanksgiving and the holiday that you're really trying to get this bivalent vaccine. And we're going to spend some time on which one to take. So uh, multiple uh, data and a lot of confusion in the press. So the Moderna bivalent vaccine, uh, Moderna has just reported showing a 15 time increasing in the neutralizing antibody compared to where you were before the vaccine called pre-booster level. Um, and it's 5x higher compared to just using another booster of the original Wuhan vaccine and, and six times higher if you had a, provid, a prior COVID infection. So if you are a hybrid, i.e. you have had the boosters and an infection there, it basically helped boost up the existing antibody, which is a bit higher than person with a still a version of COVID. Uh, it has been shown to be protective against the BQ11, which is the one we worry about. Pfizer has shown a tenfold increase, so Moderna seems to be a little bit better than Pfizer's, against the BA4 and BA5. And it's a bit different between the younger population and the, and, and the older adults there. Uh, so you can see the older adults had a bigger boost uh, of the antibody there. Novavax, on the other hand, didn't show any advantage, so that bivalent is not working. So multiple studies, I'm just going to go at the high level there, but you can see there has been uh, some against the live virus, which is what you really want to see as opposed to pseudo virus in the labs. And this is, I think, why there's been some confusion. Some of the early reports were on this pseudo virus in the Petri dish, and that is not really real world. The live virus, I think, that Moderna and Pfizer have just reported uh, is much more reassuring that it is more protective. So let's take a look at some of the data. This is the one on Pfizer, and, and Pfizer is in that, um, uh, you know, it's compared now against all the different variants. So you can see the Wuhan is on the left, BA4, 5. And then the one we're concerned about is the one I have, the blue arrow, which is the BQ11. And you can see the before and after. You see there's a significant increase uh, in the neutralizing antibody there up to 8x um, and compared to just having a booster with the original uh, Wuhan, which is only 1.8x, i.e. doesn't do too much. So really, really want to get a bivalent vaccine. Uh, and then we have this new one emerging called the XB11, which is also effective. So uh, the, the Pfizer data is very supportive of an effectiveness against this BQ11. Uh, now, separating the difference between people who have never had an infection to people who have had an infection before that, that the bivalent vaccine, and there's a bit of a difference, if you had never an infection before, you get a bigger booster than if you were using the original. You can see that that graphic here is a 12x booster there. And so, uh, so highly recommended that people who have never had COVID really take the bivalent. And if you had been infected before, you get a 6x. The reason why it's a 6x versus 12x 
is because you had a high amount of antibodies. People who have had an infection have higher levels uh, of antibody than somebody who basically had never been infected there. But in both cases, you get higher antibodies, and if you had, if you're a hybrid, i.e., you have been infected there, you get a higher amount overall. You can see four, 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 uh, which is a higher amount of protection there. So, uh, in the either case, you should get the bivalent. Uh, another data came out uh, showing the difference between having one booster, two boosters, and the bivalent. And this is, you can see that uh, the original Wuhan is not working against the BA275 and the BQ1, which I'll show here in the red box. It doesn't really protect you. And that little dotted line is the level at which we can no, no longer detect the antibody. So absolutely ineffective. So if you just rely on the original vaccination, you're not protected. If you get the bivalent, you can see the, the significant increase for both the, the 275, the BA5, and more importantly, the BQ11, which is going to become dominant. So uh, there is some worry on BQ1 in the sense that if you do get sick and if you do get seriously sick, uh, we used to use monoclonal antibodies uh, in a hospital setting there. Unfortunately, it seems that this BQ1 is evading most of the monoclonal antibodies. And there were two papers uh, that just came out in the last few days that you can see at the bottom there is, is the red, the BQ11, and absolutely the percent of inhibition of the antibody is not working for the BQ1. I mean, that's pretty clear cut, except maybe for sotrovimab. But then a new paper just came out today showing that even with sovotrimab, it is not working. And so, so uh, the BQ11 resistance to monoclonal antibody is a concern for people who got serious complications and go to the hospital. But there are some good news. Uh, France was a bit ahead of us with BQ11, and they have shown a rise, but not an increased rise in hospitalization. So far in the U.S., uh, we have seen the same thing. And then the other interesting news is that the BQ11 had a 110% growth advantage over BA5, which is why it took it over, and that's now dropping. So, so the hope is that this BQ1 may basically spread across the population that was infected, but may not create a huge problem with severe, uh, I basically mentioned severe hospitalization, that would have required monoclonal antibody in the past. Um, so uh, again, going back into the information there, because a lot of people are telling me, how do we know the data? So this is the Omicron variants, and, and do they escape... Uh, basically the immune system. And so ED50 is the, the amount of neutralization antibody that, that basically are effective. So low is basically show in this case that you have a low efficacy of antibody. And this is after three Pfizer vaccination uh, before you do the bivalent. And you can see, again, it's not protective. One month post the third dose doesn't really do too much for the CBQ1, worked great for the original Wuhan and for the BA5, but not for these new variants that we're dealing with. Say so think four months post the third dose, you're pretty much nothing. To measure it here, um, if you had a breakthrough, you have that natural immunization that provides some, some protection again, but remember the slide I just showed, you can really boost that high level of immunization there uh, with the, the bivalent. So in any case, wait 60 days after an infection, and you, know, you may want to consider getting the bivalent vaccine. So really uh, important to look at this data there, and, and really what we worry about is this BQ1, uh, you know, and you really need to basically jack this up to a high level there to be protected. So you don't want to get the booster too soon. I've talked to a few people there to say, oh, I just got COVID and I'm quickly going to get my booster. Don't do that, because what the data shows is that you have a suboptimal B cell response within the 60-day post-infections. And that's because the body gets confused and it thinks it's another infection. And so you're not really building the antibody uh, that you're looking for. And so, so again, the CDC is recommending 90 days. Uh, this data was on 60 days. So between 60 to 90 days is kind of the window at the earliest you want to get your booster there. So just uh, so just be aware, you know, just give your give immune system some time so that it, it increases the antibody instead of fighting the antibodies that you create. So uh, let's talk a little bit about long COVID. There's some updates in that area. Do in that area, uh, trying to if you remember, long COVID is a respiratory diseases, but also has a neuroinflammation that increases the cytokines in the central uh, fluids there, and unfortunately seems to be damaging the, the neurons and create that brain fog that some people have been complaining about. We do think it's a combination of autoimmunity, some type of 
a rare infection that got reactivated there, uh, some neurovascular uh, damage there due to thrombolytics, i.e. blood clots, and I believe it's also uh, due to a neurological damage across the body in the brain and the, in the neuroperiphery. So long COVID is real. And this is a brand new uh, paper that shows that, yes, adults are mostly at risk for long COVID, but children and adolescents are also at risk. This is a German study on 150,000, 157,000 adults and 12,000 children, so quite significant data set. And, and you can see that the, uh, the children and the adolescents can end up in the ICUs and complication with long COVID. They have a higher chance of get, if they were in the ICU in hospitals to basically develop long COVID. So uh, how to avoid long COVID? Just a reminder, mask and ventilation, you know, use common sense depending on the environment you're in. If you're fully boosted, the data has shown that you increase your protection against long COVID by 30 to 50 percent. I.e., if long COVID on somebody who is not vaccinated is 30 percent, maybe you get to 15 percent. And then if you do get infected, take Paxlovid because a, a recent study has shown that Paxlovid decrease uh, long COVID risk by 26%. So uh, just be aware if you do get infected and if you're over 65, you know, request Paxlovid just to protect you against long COVID. This is the data where you can really see it's a very large study from the VA. So it's a bit biased towards white male. Uh, but this again is a very large control group of 47,000 people. You can see the control group uh, developing uh, the, the long COVID risk versus the control versus the people who had Paxlovid, and it clearly um, uh, was lower death and hospitalization, but more importantly, long COVID risk was decreased. So there's no huge trial that started with the NIH to see if we can use Paxlovid to treat long COVID, and it's too early to tell. So uh, Paxlovid also, in all the different type of complications, seems to be decreasing fatigue and gastrointestinal and pulmonary complication of long COVID there. So Again, the takeaway there is that if you unfortunately do get infected there, do request Paxlovid because it will help you recover faster, decrease the risk of hospitalization, but more importantly, decrease your risk of long COVID long term. Uh, my last slide is, is just to be aware that we have that increase of RS, RSV across uh, the U.S. in kids and also adults. So it is, it's not just for babies. Uh, is now what we've seen in the last several weeks is, is not less than two years old, but up to four years old, but also adults over the age of 65. For the babies, they develop bronchiolitis, which is an inflammation of the small airways, and then they have small airways, so the, they get easily plugged with mucus, and you get this, this infection. infection. For the elderly, it's pneumonia, especially for people who have had congestive heart failures there. And I think what gets everybody worried is that most of the pediatric hospitals now are pretty much close to full, but it's an earlier rise, significantly earlier than before, and a faster rise. So we're concerned for the next several months that we may have a, a, a little bit of a bad situation there for kids. So again, use common sense if you have small kids there. You know, as far uh, you know, protections, distance, uh, you know, ventilations, and you know, and then just be careful what you touch. You know, I know it's difficult to do that. So I wish you a, a fantastic Thanksgivings. This was a quick update. Uh, so the takeaway for me is that I did take my uh, my bivalent vaccine. I had to use Pfizer because at the time Moderna was not available. But if you have a choice, Moderna seems to have better data as far as protection there. And if you have had an infection with 60 to 90 days before getting the bivalent vaccine, but it will really help you in what we expect an upcoming surge uh, in December and January. Stay healthy. Please post this to your network so we can help other people make informed decisions. Thank you.